A Turn of the Year Pause is a series of four episodes in a special series of the Overwhelm is Optional podcast for you to take a pause as we turn from 2021 into 2022 so that you can get out of the overwhelm and release 2021, celebrate 2021 and take forward whatever you want to into 2022. So if that sounds like something you'd value, then please go to www.heidimark.co.uk forward slash pause to get a special free workbook to accompany you as you listen to the series. Welcome to the Overwhelm is Optional podcast, where we cut through the fog of overwhelm so you can see all the ways to start creating a life that works for you. Hello and welcome to the first in a special series of episodes to help you reclaim your life from overwhelm by taking a turn of the year pause with me. So let's start. We're going to start by just taking a moment to get out of the head into the body with just a really short neutral noticing practice. Now, if you're listening to this driving, please don't do this. Do it later. Um, So. Otherwise, if you're sitting comfortably or standing, walking, it doesn't matter. Just gently allowing your awareness to move out of your environment, if it's safe to do so, and into your feet. Feel your feet on the ground. Get really curious about the physical sensation of your feet on the ground. And then maybe allowing the belly to soften if it wants to and if it doesn't that's okay just notice completely neutrally how you feel in this moment feel your feet on the ground allow your belly to soften or not maybe allow the shoulders to move away from the ears And just notice, notice how you feel in this moment. And as you pause with me to take stock of your year, just allowing space around you, allowing yourself to fully focus on my words, just for a short part of your day. So feeling your feet on the ground, allowing yourself to be fully here and notice how it feels to give yourself that time and space or not. So you may be in a busy environment. You may find it really, really difficult to carve out this time for yourself. You may just allow my words to drift over you as you're cooking or on the way to the shops or driving. That's okay. You're here. So ideally, I'd like you to take some time with a pen and notepad and and really get stuck in. But I appreciate that that's just not always possible. And I think it's better just to show up without judgment than it is to say, well, this isn't the ideal time because we know what happens when we wait for the ideal time. It doesn't happen. So, yes, if you can create time for yourself, that would be really good. But if you can't, I'd rather you were just here because listening and allowing the idea that you could create space for yourself in some way or just allowing the questions to seep into you. Whenever we ask questions to ourselves, the questions stay with us and answers will come to you over the next few weeks or maybe even the next few years. And that's still helpful. So be here as much as you can be here and then let go of any need to think you ought to be doing it better. Just be here as much as you can. You're really, really welcome. So this is the first in a series of episodes to support you in noticing how overwhelmed you were in 2021. And then with that awareness, you may be able to let go of some of the overwhelm into 2022. And how cool would that be? Because overwhelm robs you of your life. And I'm not talking about temporary overwhelm when you're really, really busy. I'm talking about a tendency to get stuck in your head, a tendency to 
get caught up in shoulds and oughts and self-doubt and self-judgment and thinking you ought to be better in some way. Um, just that horrible cloggy feeling of overwhelm that stops you living with ease, that stops you really just doing what you want to do and, and being how you want to be. And not everybody has this, but I certainly am prone to it. And that's why I've developed all of the things I teach. That's why I've become passionate and not just a little bit geeky about overwhelm, the causes, solutions, and the kind of people who, like me, tend to get stuck in stuck in your head with self-doubt or recriminations or this ridiculously long list about how we ought to be better in some way. Because you know what? It's heavy and it's tiresome and it's no way to live. And it also blocks us, I believe, from seeing the easier ways. So when I went through my period of intense overwhelm, struggling to fit into a career that didn't really work for me, if I, I didn't realise it was the overwhelm. I was so busy trying to find a solution to how I could improve myself or my working environment or make my home life easier to run that I, I just missed the fact that actually the problem was I couldn't see. The overwhelm was blocking the whole range of actually limitless ways that I could have made it easier. So for me, starting with the overwhelm, it's really important. It matters. And we dismiss it very easily by saying, oh, yeah, I'm overwhelmed as if it's nothing. But actually, it's the mind and the nervous system overloaded. And it's actually a warning that you may be taking an unnecessarily difficult route through life. At least that's what it means for me. And I know also for my students in my courses and my clients. So welcome. So let's begin by doing some messy journaling. So messy journaling is where you're not writing in order to read it. Now, some of it you are going to want to be able to read back, but most of it, you, you it doesn't matter because these questions will stay with you and other things will come up. So you're not looking for one right answer. You're not looking to do anything neatly. You're not going to keep this. It's not that it's not. It is important. The process is important. The um words on the page are not. So the outcome isn't important. The process is what's important. And when we make journey messy, we allow ourselves to just do it. And that's what's important. Otherwise, if we get caught up in the, oh, is this the right answer? Oh, I don't think I can read that. How do you spell that? Who cares? So no grammar, no spelling, no um, one right answer, please, allowed. This is your time. And if you're not able to do the journaling at the moment, then just allowing um, answers to bubble up, allow your thoughts to drift over it and just to just be open. So whether you're writing or not, be open, open to self-coaching, which is what you're actually doing. So I'm going to ask a series of questions and whatever comes up, write it down. Just see what comes up without judgment. Now, this is really important. So you are neutral noticing your messy journaling. You are neutral noticing your reactions and thoughts and answers to my questions. So when judgment comes, notice that too. And you can even, if you want to, you can say, oh, I'm being so critical and judgmental about myself or other people or situations or whatever. You can write that down as well because it's all just useful information. Are you ready? Let's do this. OK, the first one, the first set of questions are about overwhelm, spookily enough. Ready? How overwhelmed were you during 2021? How overwhelmed were you in general? When did you feel most overwhelmed? So when was it? When were the, the kind of sticky parts of the year which were just like ridiculous where were you what were you doing and who were you with so these questions are about getting really really specific now as i'm recording this i'm not going to be able to give you enough time to answer in full so you're just if you're doing this with me you can either pause or you can um, just write bits down for now and then print off the free PDF if you've signed up for that and go through them again. It's up to you. So you can either do it with me now and pause and give yourself time 
or you can just do a run through and let whatever comes up comes up. But ideally, you'd give yourself some more time. So that was how overwhelmed were you? When did you feel most overwhelmed? Where were you? What were you doing? And who were you with? So this is getting really specific about the crunch points so that you can find out for you what your triggers are to feeling overwhelmed without judgment, without trying to change anything, without trying to solve anything. Just notice completely neutrally what comes to mind and just take your first answer for now. And then going into what did this feel like to you? So overwhelm feels different to different people, but for some of us, it feels similar. So you may find that it feels like a big fog on your brain. It may, may feel like you're literally pushing your mind to think and it's kind of feeling bruised on the inside of your skull. You may literally get a series of headaches because it's just too much. You're pushing yourself too hard. It's really, really hard to think through overwhelm. Also, it may end up in the body as a kind of held pattern of tension. You know, like there's the, the obvious ones, aren't there? Like stiff neck, um, tight jaw, um, pain around the eyes from holding tension around the eyes, squinting at words. So what comes up for you? Maybe you don't know, and that's okay. But just see what comes up. And then there's the costs of overwhelm, which I would argue are really, really high. So just thinking about the costs of overwhelm, for example, what did the overwhelm prevent you doing? So there may be things that you cancelled because it was just too much. and You just had to keep getting through and, and you couldn't do that and that. So you just got through. So there's those costs. Then there's the costs of if you push yourself really hard through a period of overwhelm afterwards, how exhausted were, were you? Did you get sick? Did you feel unwell? Did you have minor sprains and injuries? Anything that kind of comes up for you, what were the costs? There's also the financial costs because when we make bad decisions under the influence of overwhelm, we can make expensive decisions. We can also be more accident prone and break things. And then there's the opportunity costs where we just didn't notice that there was good stuff going on because we were so focused on getting through. It was so, it's tunnel vision overwhelm. So see what the costs were, what it prevented you from doing. And then turning that around, there's the, what did you manage to do despite the overwhelm? So this is the, the fact that actually a lot of us function really, really highly in overwhelm and I know for my students and clients and for myself you wouldn't know when we're really really overwhelmed not really because we hide it really really well so despite your overwhelm what did you still manage to do without judgment okay so if you've got more you want to write I would pause now and just get the overwhelm stuff out and we are moving on to ease. Now I argue that the overwhelm and the ease coexist but that when we're in overwhelm we, we don't notice the ease and that to notice the ease takes practice. So when we did the little neutral noticing um, practice at the beginning to get you focused on yourself I took you out of your head into your body by directing your attention down to your feet and then your belly and allowing the belly to soften when we allow the belly to soften, we allow a softening in the body. We allow the nervous system to reset if it wants to. But we're never trying to relax, never trying to do anything because you can't try to be at ease. You can't force yourself out of overwhelm. But if the overwhelm and the ease coexist, but the overwhelm prevents you from feeling and seeing the ease, and the ease to me is this feeling at home in yourself. There's a beautiful line in Sleepless in Seattle. And he says that it was like coming home, but no home I'd ever known. He's actually talking about his wife who had died. But there's something beautiful in that to me that I like to guide myself 
back home to feeling at home in, in myself, in my body. And that's about deep self-acceptance, trust, reconnecting to myself. And that's what I do with my students and clients. And that's what I do on this podcast. So for me, it's about helping you reconnect with yourself. And that the overwhelm is just this overwhelmed mind, overwhelmed nervous system that gets stuck in high alert, which we don't realise because we're kind of surrounded by everybody running around in overwhelm. It's so normal to say, yeah, I'm fine, I'm busy, 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 and have no time to pause, no time to think, no time to reset, which is what I love about this quiet time of the year, this turning of the year. It's a really good reminder that rushing through life in overwhelm is no way to live. And that the ease is always there for you. And that by learning to control your attention, to move your attention from the overwhelm to the ease, you gain more ease. So, and within neutral noticing, we do that. So when I say to you, feel your feet on the ground, you're moving your attention from whatever's going on in your mind, whatever's going on externally, into your feet. That is a brilliant practice of not just awareness, but also attention control. And awareness and attention control are two of the most powerful things you can practice if you want your life back, if you want to reclaim your life from overwhelm. So, when did you feel most at ease during 2021? And that's an, I know that's a really unusual question. Because I bet it's easier for you to tell me when you felt most overwhelmed. And you may immediately think, well, I didn't feel at ease at all. Okay, if that's your answer, that's your answer. Just write it down. I didn't feel at ease. And how does that make you feel? If you can start to think sometimes when you did feel at ease, even just for a moment, then write those down. And then start to see if you can remember what ease feels like to you? What does it feel like? Or what might it feel like? So if if you don't know, that's not unusual. That's okay. But what might it feel like? So the quote from Sleepless in Seattle, when Tom Hanks says, it was like coming home, but like no home I'd ever known. So to me, I like this state of empowered ease. That's what I'm always aiming for in my work. Empowered ease, that means you're at ease, but you're in a very powerful state of ease. So it's that resting ease. It's that always ready for anything, but relaxed, as opposed to the laid back. I'm completely relaxed and I wouldn't care about anything. And that's also a lovely place to be. But we don't, we don't want to just be able to go from sleepy and really really chilled out to really really focused and in emergency mode in between that is this empowered ease so for me the problem with always being on and doing things is we're actually in the emergency mode which from an evolutionary point of view is supposed to be for saving our life so you know if a bear was chasing you And when we talk about resetting the nervous system, we often kind of imagine really relaxing. But what if there's this bit in between that's that's a really good place to just be most of the time? And I'm calling that a state of empowered ease. So you're at ease, but you're and you feel at home in yourself and you're ready to do whatever you need to. You can focus, but you don't get stuck in emergency mode. Or when you do get stuck in emergency mode and really overwhelmed, you notice. And then you take steps to bring yourself back by just noticing. And then you get to feel at ease. And then there's the other state, which is when you're really, really relaxed. But it's very, very hard to go from push, push, push to relaxed. That's why we end up drinking or really, really like hard. A lot of people run, don't they? Run really hard or lift weights or do something to, to, to change state. 
what if we could just, what if your natural state is one of empowered ease, of feeling at home in yourself? Just a thought. So anyway, if you can locate any time when you felt at ease and just either imagining it or trying to recall it and write it down. Where were you? What were you doing and who were you with? So getting specific can help, but you might not you might not be able to locate anywhere in the year that you found at ease. You felt at ease. And if that's so, know that that's OK and drop the judgment. But when I'm talking about ease, notice instead what that brings up for you. Don't you want more of that next year? I know I always do. OK, now we're going to look at achievements. So what did you achieve this year? What are you proud of? What are your major achievements of the year? And do you know what? Getting through is an achievement. That's OK. It doesn't have to just be like external things that you can, you know, write home about. It doesn't have to be one of those terrible Christmas letters where everybody shows off about what they've done. So, you know, getting through is an achievement. But just notice what comes up for you. So what what are your achievements? What do you what are you proud of? And then the opposite is what did you not achieve or complete that you really, really wanted to? And then notice if that's kind of hanging around, it's like that's going to be next year or is it time to drop it? So just noticing what comes up. And then what did you get through that felt really tough? So if you had some really tough times, what were they? And then what did that cost you? So what did you sacrifice or postpone to get through a period that was really difficult? And when I say really difficult, I mean difficult for you. I'm not talking, I'm not naming anything. I'm not talking about a major disaster or a major life event. It's not important what it is. It's what it is for you. Because this is all about you. So if you just went through a period of a few weeks that were just, just felt really hard, that's what I'm talking about. And what did you sacrifice or postpone? to just get through and then have you reclaimed your sense of self since then so by that I mean what often happens when we go through times we find difficult is we get stuck in pushing on through so I'm asking you if you've managed to let go of that and just feel like yourself again or not without judgment just noticing because it's all just useful information what's going on for you what are you holding on to what you're not ready to let go of. It's just information. And then lastly, woohoo, unexpectedly lovely things. So what unexpectedly lovely things happened this year? Unexpectedly lovely. So if you haven't listened to my unexpectedly lovely episode, I don't know which one it is, you have to have a look, or you're not one of my um, students or clients or anybody who uses my unexpectedly lovely practice I will describe it to you unexpectedly lovely things are things that are unexpectedly lovely which means that you have to search for them you have to practice noticing them because they're they're everywhere but we don't notice them and that's not our fault it's nothing wrong with us it's just that the mind has a cognitive bias to keep you safe so it's not very helpful if you're looking at an unexpectedly lovely sunset and then a bear comes along and eats you. So, of course, your brain is wired for being wary of bears. Of course it is. Otherwise, we would have died out a long time ago because there's been beautiful, unexpectedly lovely sunsets since the beginning of time. So the only way we've managed to survive is, is having a cognitive bias towards noticing doom and disaster and rehearsing the future you know, worrying. Uh oh, what if, what if, what if? So I better not stop and look at that sunset in case a bear comes along and eats me out of nowhere. So unexpectedly lovely things is a practice which sounds fluffy, but it really isn't because it's actually not that easy. The reason it's 
it's unexpectedly lovely is if I asked you to look for lovely things very quickly, you'd be, oh, that's lovely, that's lovely, that's lovely, done. It's like gratitude. Gratitude is, is an awesome practice and there's tons of research on how it can change your life. But it can get to a stage where, yeah, I'm really grateful for that. I'm really grateful for that. I'm really grateful. For that. And you don't feel it. We want to feel this. We want to re if you're serious about rewiring the brain for ease and happiness and more joy, then unexpectedly lovely because it's a little bit harder because you have to look again. So you can look at the same thing every day that's lovely, but you've got to find something unexpectedly lovely about it each time you do it. And because it's harder and because it takes a split second longer, it will rewire the brain faster. At least that's my intent and my belief. I haven't done any, you know, brain scans with anybody on this. Maybe we could. That'd be exciting. But it doesn't really matter because the experiment is N equals one. The number of people in the experiment is one. You. This is all about you. Who cares? Who cares if it works for somebody else? Does it work for you? And how do you find out? You experiment. You try it. You play. You say, oh, I wonder if I can find something unexpectedly lovely right now. And then if you do find something, you can increase the effect by feeling in your body the appreciation for it. Or not. Keep it easy. Keep it simple. Don't get overwhelmed with this stuff. No. We're all about ease here. Anyway, so the question was, what unexpectedly lovely things happened this year? See what comes up could take longer than the what disasters happened. That would be normal. That's okay. You can allow these questions. These questions will keep washing over you for the next few days. So if something comes up, jot it down. Why? Because you want to notice these things. Notice the good stuff. Then you get more of it because we get more of what we focus on. So if you have identified something unexpectedly lovely, big, small, in between, how did these things or this one thing make you feel? How did it feel? What does unexpectedly lovely feel like for you? In the body, in the heart, in the mind? Just notice. Paying attention to the whole of your being, not just your mind. How your body feels when you eat something unexpectedly delicious, for example. It's drawing your attention. It's, it's, it's awareness and attention. It's all the same thing. Neutral noticing. Although this isn't very neutral, I admit. This is not neutral because it's deliberately noticing good stuff in order to um, change the cognitive bias. So your mind is absolutely superb at pointing out everything that's wrong. If you want to notice what's right and what feels good, and if you want to feel more at ease, you have to practice. And then noticing in the body and the heart and the mind. So noticing, getting more and more specific just deepens the practice. And it's nice. It's fun. And what was my next question? Yes. And the last question is, is there anything you could do to increase the likelihood of more unexpectedly lovely things? Well, I would say notice them. But there might be something else that comes up because if you've got something specific, you could think, oh, well, that's because and I could. And that, so if that's happening, write those down now because they're good. You want those. They're useful. OK, and to round this off, because I want to keep these episodes short so you've got time to do them. Um, looking back at the whole year, so you've just been through your whole year to take stock. I'm going to ask you to pick three words that summarise 2021 for you. Three words that summarise 2021 with the warning. <laughs> it's just for now. You can change them later. Like you're not going down in history as 2021 was the year of blah, blah, blah. No, there's no one right answer. You're just noticing. And you've just, I've asked you some big questions and there's a lot to process and summarising in three words can be helpful or not. But there aren't just three words, are there? So just pick three for now and then you can change them. You can do what you want. It's your life and it's your taking stock exercise. 
And that's it for this episode. I'll see you at the next one. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Overwhelm is Optional podcast. If you'd like the free company workbook that goes with the turn of the year series, then please go to www.heidimark.co.uk forward slash pause.